So thank you all very much for joining us today. My name is Anna Ferry. I am a student here at the School of Library Archival and Information Studies, though I think most of the people in this room know that. And uh, I am very happy to welcome a wonderful panel to talk to us about intellectual freedom and lived experiences and lived uh, understandings of what intellectual freedom is today. We have a wonderful moderator t today. We have Ingrid Perrant, who is uh, our university librarian here at UBC. She is a graduate of SLAE, so she is an alumni here. Um, and she has spent most of her career at the National Library of Canada, uh, ending with the Assistant Deputy Minister position. She has been the university librarian here at UBC since 2009, and she is the former president of IFLA. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot remember off the top of my head what IFLA stands for. Inter International Federation of Library Associations. Thank you. Uh, and uh, she's also a member of quite a number of different uh, national and international boards on library issues. So please welcome Ingrid Prom. Thanks very much, uh, Anna. And I'm really pleased to be invited to moderate uh, this panel discussing intellectual freedom from, I think, from various points of view uh, during this week of freedom to read. So as a librarian, and like all librarians, I think, you know, we believe in and we're committed to intellectual freedom, including some of the basic principles around freedom of expression and access to information. And I've, in my work with IFLA, I had a lot to do with freedom of expression around the world. And I know that the UN, the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights was something I always cited in terms of what are the rights for intellectual freedom. And of course, in Canada, as you know, we have the Charter of Rights and Freedoms as well. So we're well protected by the law. But as we know, there are many cases of restrictions on access to information and intellectual freedom and even here in Canada. And one of the things I sort of found out about was when I was asked to be a calendar girl um, uh, <laughs> a few years ago uh, for uh, an issue of um, IFLA that was about uh, censorship. And I did the first day of December. Uh, it's like an advent calendar. You know, every day someone talks about intellectual freedom issues. And so I looked into, well, in Canada, what was going on. And, you know, I, I picked the book, um, The Wars, by Timothy Findlay. This was a book that was published in 1977. It won the Governor General's Award. Fantastic book talking about the First World War, a young man, his horse, and sort of the trauma of it. Well, what I read about a few years ago was that a school board in Ontario was banning it from the schools. And this was just a few years ago. So I think that's, it's an example of sort of the serendipity or the unpredictability of how people react to different expressions of information and how do we deal with it. So I found that really enlightening. And I know there are many examples of uh, restrictions on intellectual freedom, uh, banning books, for example, but also freedom of the press. You know, the recent um, incidents with Charlie Hebdo uh, in France and elsewhere. Uh, the impact of the internet on accessibility or not. Is it more accessible or is it less accessible because of the internet? And of course, the impact on a diverse society. How do we all react to access to information and intellectual freedom, uh, especially in a society we have in Canada? So um, I'm really pleased that we have four experts, four knowledgeable people here to share their perspectives on s these questions that we all have to deal with. So what I'll do is I'm going to introduce each panelist as they speak. Uh, I'll give them five minutes to talk about their perspective, their views on intellectual freedom. And once all four have spoken, then we'll open it up for debate, discussion, and questions. So get your questions ready, uh, because I hope we have a lively, a lively discussion. So our first speaker, uh, in no particular order, Although he is here on my left, Gregory Mackey. Um, Dr. Mackey is assistant professor in the Department of English here at UBC, where he teaches Victorian literature, drama, and book history. And I know Professor Mackey because he and his PhD student, Justin O'Hearn, 
worked with UBC Libraries Rare Books recently on the acquisition of a rare 19th century erotic novel, actually two of them, Telony and Des Grieux. So, without further ado, Dr. Mackey, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm just going to sit. Uh, keep it as, as oh, oh, do you want? Um... Oh, okay, so the internet can hear. Hello, internet. <clears throat> I'm now speaking to the internet. <clears throat> I thought my voice could carry, but whatever. I think I'm basically going to just talk about the story, uh, the narrative of the library's acquisition of, of these books and, and how it actually became uh, a media story. We were really surprised at the amount of attention that the acquisition of these books garnered. So it, it started last fall with a, a graduate student of mine uh, who is doing a PhD in English on uh, <clears throat> Victorian pornography. Uh, from a, a print culture perspective. So he's looking at the networks of circulation of uh, a more or less obscene books in, uh, in late 19th century London. And <clears throat> he happened to come across a Christie's auction catalog that was offering for sale an extraordinarily rare book called Des Grieux, uh, the prelude to Telony. Now, I have to go back a little bit. Telony is a well-known uh, homoerotic novel from uh, 1893, often cited as the first gay novel. <clears throat> it, it is a, a, a sort of a tragic romance and uh, does focus uh, specifically on the, uh, the romantic and ultimately tragic relationship between two men with a lot of very vivid uh, sexual uh, description. Uh, this book has infamously been misattributed to Oscar Wilde. <laughs> I have a bit of an investment in this because Oscar Wilde is actually uh, my specialty and I'm working on a, on a project on Wilde at the moment. Uh, <clears throat> and it's been published uh, many times in more accessible uh, paperback editions uh, for, uh, as, as a Wilde text. Now its prequel, uh, a book that was actually published a little bit later, uh, is more or less unknown to scholarship. Uh, there are only uh, three copies exist in, uh, extant in the world. At this auction, we were able to acquire both the first edition of Telony, uh, and ours is the only copy in North America now, and uh, a copy of, uh, of Des Grieux. Uh, no study has been done on the relationship between these two books, so we've got uh, a huge opportunity and resource here at UBC to do work in, uh, in terms of 19th century uh, erotic literature, in terms of uh, queer history and, uh, and culture that's really unparalleled in the world right now. <clears throat> and in terms of uh, intellectual freedom, one of, our, one of our anxieties, I suppose, when, when we were uh, importing the books, they, had, they were sold in London, and we had a, we had a very exciting uh, morning, very, very early, about 5 a.m., we, uh, a lot of us uh, got together, the team uh, that assembled uh, to purchase these books got together uh, here at the library at 5 in the morning to watch the live auction live stream from London. And we bid and, and we succeeded in, in obtaining the books. And it took a while for the books to get to us. We were worried that uh, because of the content of these books, uh, that Canada Customs might actually uh, you know, use its, its arbitrary power in the way that they did with the Little Sisters, the, the gay bookstore in, uh, in the Davie Village here in Vancouver, uh, to prevent these books from actually getting to us. But by saying that they were you know, lost text by Oscar Wilde, we were actually able uh, to get them through <laughs> relatively easily, which is actually extremely ironic considering that 100 years ago in the early 20th century, Oscar Wilde's name actually underwrote the circulation of a lot of uh, pornographic work. And indeed, because of his own scandal and, and the trial where he was convicted for homosexual offenses, uh, his work was uh, no longer published for quite some time. And so it's, it's funny just to think, you know, more than a century later that now using Oscar Wilde as a kind of cover actually <laughs> allowed us uh, to import these books. And again, we're the only place in, in North America uh, to have them. Uh, so it's a, it's a great boon to, to UBC and to this kind of research uh, for us to, to have acquired uh, these books. And <clears throat> because of Wilde's name, you know, with the CBC and eventually the Guardian in, in England uh, got interested in the story. So it's, it's bringing some really, uh, some really, I think, valuable attention to, to UBC Library. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of these stories were 
you know, more, some of the stories were somewhat more explicit than, than others. <laughs> uh, the, the story in Extra, the, the Vancouver now defunct, the print version is now defunct, gay newspaper was, was a little bit different from some of the others. Uh, but <clears throat> nonetheless, I think it was, it's been a really valuable exercise. And all of the press coverage has been quite positive. Uh, we haven't received uh, any, any negative media about this, which I think is a, is a really good indication of, uh, of progress. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't want to be you know, sunny and Pollyanna and, and unrealistic about it, but on the other hand, I think it is a good indication of, uh, of, of progress. Uh, that could be also partly related to the fact that these are such old things. Uh, but, <clears throat> you know, the oldness of the text is also, I think, quite indicative of the continuity and the history uh, of, uh, of gay culture. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, interviewers asked me, well, were, were there actually gay people back then? And did they read these books? Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm not kidding. I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> that was followed up by a question about, oh, could that many people read? And I said, in 1893? We're not talking about 1593 or 1493. But, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> I'm in an English department, so I get to be snobby about these things. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> uh, yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it was actually quite encouraging. And uh, I've been getting also you know, letters from, uh, from scholars around the world who are quite excited about this. So I'm hoping that, uh, that people will be coming, scholars and, and students will be coming to UBC to, uh, to work with these texts, to see them, and uh, hopefully to get a, a fuller sense of, uh, of the culture of, uh, of 1890s, uh, the homosexual underground in 1890s London. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, description of that acquisition. It was a real coup for the library to get those items in. It's thanks to uh, Professor Mackey that we were able to do that. Okay, um, our next panelist is Tara Robertson. And Tara is the Accessibility Librarian at Caper, BC, which is located at Langara College. Her team serves post-secondary students with print disabilities across BC by creating custom audiobooks and e-books of their textbooks. Tara was very active with the BCLA Intellectual Freedom and Information Policy Committees and was on the advisory board of the Library Juice Press Handbook for Intellectual Freedom published in 2014. She is on social media with a blog and on Twitter. So you see she has her computer with her, the only one. Um, and uh, she is apparently very accessible online. So Tara, please. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so when librarians talk about intellectual freedom, the conversation is often centered around books. We talk about banned books, our book collection policies, um, the importance of or what to do when a patron challenges a book in our collection. So most of my career has not been about books. So I'd like to talk about how I think we can be doing a better job of applying the values of intellectual freedom to the digital realm. So there's kind of three things I want to talk about in these first five minutes. Um, internet filters. Um, Fraser Valley Regional Library, which is the second largest public library system in BC, currently filters all of its internet. All of the children, adult, and staff workstations are filtered. They, in their collection development policy, they reference the Canadian Library Association's uh, statement on intellectual freedom. This is great, but it's filtering all their internet isn't really in line with those values of intellectual freedom. These two things aren't congruent to me. They're not congruent at all, actually. Do I need to explain why internet filters are bad? OK, I didn't think so. Um, so looking at internet use policy, um, last fall, VPL changed their internet use policy. Um, they only filter, I think, children's workstations at advice of a lawyer. So most of the internet at VPL is not filtered, which is a good thing. Um, their acceptable use policy was changed to say, users must not, use any, must not use any workstations or the public wireless internet to display sexually explicit images. Staff will advise users, of inappropriate, advise users of inappropriate conduct as required and will ask that any behavior deemed to be inappropriate cease immediately. Violations may result in loss of privileges for both the user and cards used. 
So maybe we'll get into this later, I'm not sure. <laughs> but this policy assumes that there's a level playing field for content and our users' lives. So the phrase sexually explicit images, what, what are those exactly? Um, in my head, I've got a bunch of vivid images, but they're probably not the same as yours. Um, I'd argue, um, like any other anti-pornography policies and systemic censorship, that this will negatively impact the LGBT community in a disproportionate way. The LGBT or queer community is defined by our sexuality. So it should come as no surprise that queer culture, queer art, queer literature often deals with sex and sexuality. And for, on the user side, I have internet at home and at work. I've got a smartphone with a data plan. I don't go to the public library to use the internet. People who are poor, homeless, transient, or teenagers who do not have the same kind of internet access that I do will be affected in a different way by this policy than I will be. To me, this sounds like a design challenge. So I think the question for me is, how do you design public spaces so that users' freedom to access different kinds of information does not impact other people's? BCLA hosted an event with BC Civil Liberties Association's Michael Vaughn, who's really brilliant. She's a great speaker, if you ever get a chance to hear her. In her opinion, restrictive policy changes like this should be made only as a last resort after all design options have been exhausted. In this case, I don't believe that any design solutions were explored. So this got me thinking like, well, what are the other internet policies across Canada like? Um, I put up a Google spreadsheet and asked a couple of colleagues on Twitter, and we quickly looked at 49 public library policies across Canada. And VPLs isn't the worst by far. Um, here's some things that I was shocked to learn. The Brampton Public Library filters their wireless network. Burlington, Windsor, and Winnipeg Public Library prohibit using FTP. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why this specific use of technology is not okay for them. Calgary Public Library's policy states that um, you must not display materials on this network in the opinion of any staff are unlawful, obscene, abusive, or otherwise objectionable. Any library staff? That seems really, really broad and wide. And I was surprised at how many libraries' policies include phrases like sexually explicit materials, pornography, or overt sexual images. Richmond Hill Library and Regina Public uh, mention illicit drug literature, and a few libraries mention hate literature or hate speech. I think Toronto Public Library does the best job, um, and their policy is worth reading. I think they do a good job of balancing the user's right to access content and others' users' right to not see that. And they don't single out sexually explicit content, which I think is important. And the last thing I'm going to quickly talk about from a technology perspective is BiblioCommons. Um, are people familiar with Biblio Commons? Some, about half nods. So it's, it's a product that has, I think, a, a beautiful and thoughtful interface that sits on top of a lot of public libraries, public facing catalogs. Um, it's a huge improvement over the traditional OPAC and there's a small social component that adds users, allows users to add tags and reviews, which I think is a good thing. However, Biblio Commons allows patrons to flag content for the following reasons. Coarse language, violence, sexual content, frightening or intense scenes, and other. So this past weekend, I tested this feature and I put some fake sexual content notices on some Hardy Boys books, ha <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did this to test to see how the software works. So, just gonna digress a little bit. Two weeks ago, I was at Code for Lib in Portland and Andromeda Yelton gave the closing keynote, which is amazing and inspiring. She challenged us to think about what is library software and what is not library software. And to illustrate this, she included a screenshot of a library catalog that you get when, those are her words, when you do a keyword search that returns no hits. It dumps you on this gigantic page of search delimiters that are not even, that not even a librarian could love, let me tell you. And if I didn't get any search, if I didn't get any hits for my search results, do you think that limiting to large print Albanian is gonna make things any better? <laughs> So at this point, she says, there could have been other options there that would allow the user to keep wandering and keep finding things. 
So, in my opinion, functionality that allows users to flag titles for sexual content or coarse language, that's not library software. That's not functionality we want in libraries. And it's not in line with our core value of intellectual freedom. Devin Grayson, who's a local health librarian and researcher and a PhD candidate, kind of explained the theoretical reasons behind it. And I'm just going to quote her because she did a really good job. She says, perhaps the issue is a difference from the understanding of what is viewpoint neutral. From an intellectual freedom standpoint, suggesting categories of concern is not neutral. Deciding that sex, violence, scary, and rude are the primary reasons one would be willing to set a notice to warn others is not neutral. Why not racism, sexism, homophobia, and classism as the categories with sex, violence, and swearing? So I think that's, I've gone over my five minutes. I've got more to say about academic libraries later. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much, Tara. Okay, our next speaker is Christopher Kevlaham. Christopher has worked at the Vancouver Public Library, so maybe he knows about the change to their policy, right? Um, Vancouver Public Library for 11 years, seven years as a children's librarian, three years as the assistant manager of acquisitions and sharings, and he is now the branch head of VPL's Joel Forte's branch. He is a past president of BCLA and is very active with BCLA's Intellectual Freedom Interest Group. So I think he's very well equipped to speak to our topic today. So Christopher, over to you. Thanks, Ingrid, and thank you for having me today. I was really pleased that the library students put this on today because I felt when I was in library school, and one of my uh, partners in library school is here, Paula, that intellectual freedom was probably the most important course I took. It's become extremely practical in everything I do and how I approach librarianship. So I encourage you all to take it if you're a li uh, library student. In my day-to-day -day work as a children's librarian, acquisitions librarian, and now a branch head, I deal with intellectual freedom issues maybe about six times a week whether it's explaining to a patron why we ha have chosen to have a particular item a lot of patrons will come up and say, do you know you have this book? And I'm like, yes, I do. And I know it's really racist or homophobic or something. And I think even with book selection, we have to be constantly expanding our barriers and looking at what the community wants and what they need and highlighting that to our patrons. A big piece of intellectual freedom, believe it or not, is displays. We often choose to display, sometimes in bookstores and libraries, what's popular. But I think a big piece of intellectual freedom is displaying what's not popular. All the things we purchase that are edgy, deal with controversial issues, and so on. Also, as a librarian, you have to promote your personal boundaries. You have to push them wider and encompass the whole community. It's easy for me, to defend uh, books like Daddy's Two Roommates or Tango Makes Three, The Gay Penguins, The King and King. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's not quite as racy as that <laughs> yet. <laughs> We're getting there. Um, but you also have to defend the racist material. I had someone in the library last week looking at a Nazi hate site, um, another patron was upset by that and he remained, he was allowed to look at that, that was what he wanted. So listening to the other points of view. And unfortunately within my library career, and the reason why I was mentioning intellect, being aware of intellectual freedom is so important, is a lot of library staff will come up with reasons not to defend the item or not to engage with the patron. They'll have a challenge book and they'll say, well it's kind of dirty anyway, we'll just get rid of it. Um, that's not the way to go. If it's kind of dirty and well used, maybe you should get another copy or two. Um, I've worked with people who thought Extra West was too racy that week, so they recycled them after a day. Um, I've worked with people who decided, well, this is a great item to have in the library, but not our, our branch, and they'll send it to another branch. So these are all library workers of different classifications. So it's something to be aware of. It's something we need to talk about because not everybody is on board with intellectual freedom to the same level. When dealing 
with your coworkers and the public, a little rule to keep in mind is everyone will say they believe in freedom of expression, intellectual freedom, except for obviously this. And they'll assume that everyone is on board with what they don't accept and that we should get rid of it. Um, weeding is a huge thing. So I've mentioned if something looks um, old and controversial, they might get rid of it. But it's a really, people will often use it, library workers, as an easy way to get rid of something they don't want to defend or something personally they feel isn't good. You'll often hear a lot of library workers in selections saying, well, this isn't very well written. It doesn't fit our critical standards not to select a certain item. So they don't want to say full on that they don't agree with the subject matter, but um, they won't select it for other criteria. So unfortunately, I've seen all these things happen. Um, usually as a children's librarian, adults will come in and say, this, I'm fine with this, but this might encourage children to do something we don't want. It's bad for children, and they'll use the children as a shield for starting that conversation. So it's really good to be equipped with all those um, things. Another thing that often comes up are books. I don't have a problem with this book, but it should be labeled. I've dealt with Veggie Tales, which, if you know what it is, has a mild kind of Christian message, and people object to that, so they would like a label saying Christian material. You know, and you have to have that conversation. So for people here, I think the most practical thing is to develop a toolkit because you're going to have to deal with these selection issues and complaints from the public or queries from the public, and it's best to be prepared. I have some, more, some other things to say, but I think I'll pass it on to Miriam so we all have a chance to speak, and then if you have any questions about that, I can speak to that. We've talked about the new internet policy, and I can give the rationale for that, and um, I won't be giving my personal view, as because I'm here on as a VPL employee, but um, I'm happy to talk about that as well. Thank you. Okay, and our Final panelist is Miriam Moses. Uh, Miriam has taught courses at SLACE on intellectual freedom, and she has been on the BCLA Intellectual Freedom Committee for many, many years, she said. She's currently the Acquisitions Manager at Burnaby Public Library, which is a medium-sized public library, as we know, that takes collections very seriously. And she's also been a systems librarian and a reference librarian. So, Miriam, over to you. Thank you. Um, Ingrid didn't use the other little bit that I put in. I, I, was, I said um, that I hope that UBC libraries had recovered from the beginning of my library career when I was a shelver in the main library and was set loose with a book truck in this labyrinth of, of stacks and um, hardly any knowledge of how the LC classification system worked <laughs> and what order those books should be shelved in. And I ended that with saying staff training is a wonderful thing. And uh, <laughs> it kind of picks up from what, from what Chris was saying, because I think when we think about intellectual freedom, um, and, it, and it's something during Freedom to Read Week that we really, um, it's an opportunity to, for our own libraries to stop and pay some attention here. Um, you definitely want to, you know, and Chris has just outlined some of the ways in which it's important to make sure that everyone in the library is understanding. Like, you can have the best policy in the world about what you have, and you can sort out what things are on your free giveaway newspaper shelves. And if the building service worker is recycling the extra west because he doesn't think that we need that kind of stuff, you're not living out your policy. Um, you want to, I, I, I thought I would talk a little bit about dealing with challenges. Um, when I was talking with Chris a couple of days ago um, about the kinds of things that people complain about, he started telling me the plot of a picture book 
and he wasn't quite clear of the title, and, and I thought, oh, I know this book, and it, it, it's, it's uh, Mr. and Mrs. Pig's Evening Out. And this is a wonderful, uh, it's, a, it's a book about um, distracted parenting, because there's this family of pigs, and the parents, there's ten little piglets, the parents are completely harassed. They, their household is, you know, any household with 10 children, there's going to be a certain amount of chaos. They are going out for the evening, and they're in desperate need for an evening out. They hire a babysitter from the agency, and they don't notice that the babysitter is a wolf wearing a dress. Okay. <laughs> So uh, Chris was talking. I, I've never been involved in a challenge of, of this book. Chris, Chris has, and uh, you got the. <laughs> How could they not notice that that was a wolf? But anyway, they really needed their evening out, uh, and the kids, of course, look at the at the babysitter and they go, "Oh my God, <laughs> it's a wolf!" And 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 they're they're the older ones are are vigilant and they're able to intervene when the younger one is placed in the oven. And uh, uh, sorry, I gave away the punchline. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, I just I thought that was a really interesting. Uh, like I can understand why a parent might not wish to communicate to their child that parents can screw up in very fundamental and awful ways, and you will need to deal with it. Which I think is the message in this book, and I totally get why a parent might not wish to have that experience while reading a picture book to their child. They so think that kids need to hear that, right? And, and um, you know, I own my own copy of this book, and I'm really glad I do because it's not in our library anymore, or his library. Um, it's an older book. I'm not sure what happened. It may not be in, in print anymore, but um, I have a certain affinity for really warped picture books, so <laughs> I, I recognize that so much that uh, when, when, that I actually bought my own copy years ago after reading it to, to a child. Um, <laughs> but anyway, that's, you know, neither here nor there. I, I wanted to talk a bit about how we prepare ourselves to deal with, with challenges, because I could focus um, for certainly in the next five minutes and certainly the rest of the hour on the kind of goofy things that people get up to complaining about. And I don't do myself much service if I don't also look at the things that really upset me because let me tell you, there are things in my library that I really wish were not there, that I hate, that I don't want to buy. Uh, and, and I need to be really in tune with that and I would really encourage everybody to be in tune with that for yourselves as well. So you want to, um, like, so I can really laugh at whoever it was that wanted, was, you know, initiating the process to get Mr. and Mrs. Pig's evening out, out of the library. That's pretty funny. But when I look at Holocaust revision material, or when I look at, um, there was this book called God, the Rod, and Your Child's Bod, if you can believe it. It was a, uh, Christian manual on how to beat your children. And it's not in our library anymore. I did encounter it when I was weeding one time years ago, quite a number of years ago. I think it is also long out of print and not, um, not replaceable. And it was kind of in a in ratty condition <laughs> when I encountered it weeding. And I had to say, well, yeah, I hate this book. It's not in good condition. And that, to me, was almost a reason to leave it in, because if I was rubbing it up against my own edges, I thought I needed to not use that as a reason to, to read this book. Um, there's other stuff like that that comes up all the time. But what you want to have also behind you in your organization is some fairly clear policy in what you do have, what you have, what you don't have. And if that is good, if that is well crafted, it will really help. In you know, so if somebody is saying, you know, get this, you know, this has completely destroyed my child's faith in his parents, and I, you know, and and, and if you have a policy that's, that outlines the scope of picture books that you have in your collection, you can point to that, and 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 you will probably handle that challenge by keeping by keeping that book. And maybe you won't. I mean, there are times when we make 
purchasing mistakes. We buy things that are not that, that might not be what we thought they were when we first bought them. We buy things that are, um, um, we buy things and put them in the wrong place. Sometimes people tell us we put them in the wrong place and we don't agree. Sometimes it's true. You know, sometimes there are books that we have bought as, as children's books or as teen books that were intended for a different audience. And again, you have to be really clear on what what the parameters are around that material. If it's a book that's written for teens and it has teen characters, is marketed as a teen book, and there's a little bit more sex in it than somebody thinks they can tolerate for the teen market, so they want it moved to adult, that's maybe not a really good reason. I know, see, you have to, you have to be evaluating that all the, all the time. Um, and again, your, the policies that you have in place in your organization should be there to help. The staff training should be there to help. And it isn't always there. And um, so it's something to, to, to be aware of, to, to be ensuring that, that staff at all levels are aware of the intellectual freedom issues that, that can arise of the philosophy that the library subscribes to if the library does. And, Possibly not everyone does. Um, many public libraries will have in, had their board endorse the CLA statement on intellectual freedom, which is a really um, a strong statement that, on what the library plans to do. Now, as Tara pointed out, that doesn't always mean that actions that follow will be in alignment with that. But it is a place, it's a place to start from. I think I'll leave it at that because I'm sure you guys have stuff you want to talk about. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Miriam, and, um, uh, and your comments about having good policies, which perhaps aren't followed all the time, but also staff training, I think, is, is something that I noted from, from Miriam's talk. And did you notice, Miriam, that in the old main library, we have no more bookshelves? I hope you know that, right? See? <laughs> They're all gone. <laughs> So they have recovered from my shelving errors. Yeah. No wonder we couldn't find the books. <laughs> anyway, um, it's time for questions, um, and I hope you have some. I would just like to start with one um, for the whole panel. Um, it's around the fact of the Internet now with us. We've always dealt with books for at least 500 years. Uh, but with the Internet, what, how has that changed our thinking about public spaces? versus privacy and private spaces. I, I think this idea of you know, the inter internet expanding access to information, which it does, also restricts access to information in many ways, either through filtering or digital locks or you know, a government view or um, even a religious view um, restricting access. So that's the public side versus the private side, how people are, how people feel, their own conscience, their own tastes. How does all that play out in a, in a library setting? Like, how, how do we deal with all those conflicting uh, factors? So, any thoughts? Take, your, take the microphone, please. I'd like to add something as a non-librarian, non but a, a, a user and a big supporter of libraries. <clears throat> Uh, w one of the really interesting things in common, I think, that everyone's been talking about here is, uh, has to do with children and sexuality and, this, and, and how to deal diplomatically uh, as, as, as public employees with often a stupid and bigoted and narrow-minded public and their hysterical fear, frankly, of, of children, of exposing children to sexuality. It's just ridiculous. Like, uh, and, or, or religious fanaticism, frankly. I mean, how do you how do you deal with people who want to impose their views on everybody else? And you know, I think that is, is one way of looking at intellectual freedom that that you know we, we need to work through, right? If we are public employees, well, we are beholden to the public in some ways, but often the public is very wrong and needs to be challenged, uh, especially when the pub, when members of the public take it upon themselves to impose. 
uh, views that arise out of out of you know ignorance and, and, and bigotry. Uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on to Miriam. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a, a, an interesting question. But when we say the public, um, that's a lot of people, right? And, and um, what we often say is, well, you, you are responsible for what your own child reads. And we can't interfere with that, right? I mean, we can um, if a child comes in with a parent whose views we are aware of and uh, disagree with, we could surreptitiously slip material to that child, but that may not be that good an idea. Um, <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Um, and the line is that, you know, okay, you don't want your child to be exposed to a book that illustrates how parents can screw up totally fine. You don't read that one to your child. Don't take it out. It's going to be here, though, for the other people who, who don't share your perspective. And there are so many perspectives. You know, we, I, I get hung up on this because I, a lot of, like, I'm, I'm kind of called upon to buy lots of copies of popular books, and I do. And I also have to look at you know, there's that sort of wide band of stuff that everybody wants at the same time that you can't possibly fill the demand. But there's that other side where further out on the fringes that people don't want so much of and that we need to have as well. And we need to, to represent like a huge range of, of human knowledge. And that's our, that's our goal. I don't know if I answered you or not. <laughs> So I think that's a really interesting point, and, and I think um, we have to make sure that we're carrying material, materials that one might think are ignorant and bigoted, so it represents other things. And we do look at when people complain and explain those reasons. I do want to point out that there's an interesting, we always think of... Um, Complaints coming from the most conservative or religious elements, they come from both sides equally. So, the two sides of the spectrum. So, at one side, you're having people who complain about Harry Potter or any homosexual sex or cutting books or edgy stuff there. But we get an equal amount of complaints from people who don't like Tintin in the Congo, things that they find sexist or racist. So, one side isn't more than the other, it's in between. And both these people don't think, uh, they may be ignorant and bigoted, but neither so either side thinks they're enlightened and they're helping people. So it's navigating wow. in between. Absolutely it's a problem, but you do have to deliver the message to both sides and have a balanced collection that way. So your question was about the internet yeah. and <laughs> how that changes stuff. Um, the internet's changed a lot of things, and I think for public libraries especially, or even academic libraries where there's public space, I think we, we need to think about how our users are using our resources, the internet, among other things, and look at how to structure the space accordingly so that people can have privacy and look at what they need to look at or what they want to look at, and other people don't necessarily have to see that. And I'm not talking about a booth in the back with like a Kleenex dispenser, yeah. but... <laughs> There, this is a design problem, and I think it can be solved. Also, looking, I think our attitudes towards the internet have changed. Like looking at the public library internet policies across Canada, they, they totally read like the 90s to me, where there's a lot of disclaimers about the library saying, we can't guarantee everything that you're going to read or any links from our site are going to be correct and valid and up to date. Of course we can't. We know that's true now. Um, so I think public libraries need to look at their internet policies and do a revamp. And while I don't like the, some of the details of how VPL did it, at least they're kind of looking at that and trying to figure it out. Um, and I think in the academic context, like we're constrained by central IT. So we might have values about intellectual freedom and how we think we can use the internet and what research looks like for us, but central IT or our legal departments may not share that and may have a different kind of risk level. I talked to a colleague at York University, Lisa Slonowski. 
She's an English liaison librarian and a PhD student and one of the co-investigators of the feminist porn archive. It's a shirk funded project. It's not gonna be a brick and mortar archive of porn, sadly, um, but they're, they're coming up with issues as they put up a, a project page for their research. Is it gonna be hosted on IT servers? They're kind of just figuring these things out as they go. Um, and there's been some mutterings that maybe that site will need to be password protected. And I can't think of any shirk funded research in Canada where the, the institutional page for that research would have to be behind a login. So that hasn't happened, but they're just kind of thinking through these things. And I think the important thing, what you guys also talked about is to keep the conversation happening, both with colleagues and coworkers, to kind of figure out those gray areas. Because like, I don't know what the answer is, but I know that, like, I know I don't like certain policies, and I think we can do better. Um, I have to tell this little story about um, um, Tara sent an email to us a couple of days ago and mentioned the feminist porn archive and included on it a colleague of ours who works in a public library, which I will not name because, to protect her, the anonymity of their practices because she said I had to. And um, um, so she was included on it and then I responded to it and I got a bounce back. Because, uh, it was undeliverable, and I so I sent a message to her private address, and she said, I think I know why. It's because the P word is in it. And so I sent it back to her without... Well, I actually, I eliminated porn, feminist, and lesbian, and it did get through. Um, where I, 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 I should have eliminated them one at a time. But the moral of that story is, and that, uh, because Tara was talking about central IT and how that can impact on library services. Like this is, this is somebody, this is a librarian who cannot communicate even the title of a book which has the word porn in it to her colleagues anywhere. Okay, that seems to me a reason why having librarians as part of IT is a really good idea. Um, and if you, if you can't have some power in that, to at least have some say in that, so that absurd situations like this don't arise. Okay, thank you. So over to you. I don't want you to just sit there. Uh, any questions for the panel? And please speak loudly so the web can catch it. Or comments. I'm sure you've got opinions as well. <laughs> I have, I'm very, I was going to say interested in, but I don't know if that's quite the correct for you. I'm concerned about, I'm curious about your comments regarding kind of the quiet aspects of censorship, uh, sort of like self-censorship, censorship of marketplace, ways in which it's not out in the big, like we make big news story out of it. Um, how does this quiet censorship have an impact on the things you do? Well, one thing I mentioned when uh, when I was acquisitions librarian is a lot of we get a lot of reviews of popular books and things that publishers push that they really want to or DVDs or anything else really want to push and that'll sell well and you have to work a lot harder to find reviews or find items that aren't as popular and express a wider variety of views so that's something you really have to integrate into your work, if you just went by the, the main catalogs and resources, you, you would just be getting a small amount of opinions and so on. So it's to get the really edgy, possibly offensive stuff, but the things that um, aren't talked about as much, um, but, you, but that patrons still want. And then also in the library, as I mentioned before, promoting that. I think that with cataloging, we could do a lot better to make it uh, subject headings that are more accessible and up-to-date in accessing information that people are looking for. Um, and I think making them, a, uh, Tara mentioned the Biblio Commons, which we have at VPL, and um, using tools like that to make other voices more prevalent. But it's really the seeking out and showing these alternatives in the library is how I would address that. That was just one aspect of that. Um, another quiet kind of censorship is 
when patrons remove books or library staff and to be aware and to sometimes check the catalog to see if these are being removed and if they're still available and why and looking at those trends. That's such a good question. Like it's easy to talk about things when they're overt and kind of hit you head on. And I th think one of the things that we're dealing with like at a federal level in Canada, um, locally and within institutions is kind of a chilly climate. So federally, there's a lot of issues like net neutrality, the anti-terrorism bill, that those are library issues for me. Like the, this is the context that we're in and this is a concern and it's our professional duty, I think, to speak up. For me, part of it is like that discomfort when it's like, oh, am I gonna write a letter to the VPL board? Like, some of my colleagues aren't going to like this. This is going to be difficult. Ugh, do I really want to open this can of worms? And for me, I, I think it, one of my survival techniques has been finding colleagues who have like-minded politics and talking through these issues and having each other's backs. So. Okay. Other questions? Comments? So I'm curious about your opinions regarding libraries providing access to material that can cause actual physical harm to communities. And so I'm thinking specifically of anti-vaccination material, uh, which is leading to outbreaks of measles and other health risks. I guess I'd have to ask you back. Um, if the library doesn't have that, what does that really mean? Like, does that, does it mean that people who are interested in that will, or people who hold that opinion will never find anything about it? Will it mean that, um, does it mean that the library has had to investigate every, um, has had to investigate every health issue and come to a conclusion on what's right and what's wrong? Or are we supporting people in their ability to sort through disease. <laughs> Sorry? to support people in their ability to infect other people with diseases that are otherwise avoidable. I want to preface this just by saying that I think the anti-vaxxers are insane <laughs> and a public health risk. I was just in California uh, on doing a research trip over reading week where they were contemplating removing any religious or conscience, quote unquote, objection for parents to vaccinate their children. So it was just going to be mandatory no matter what. But I will say to your point that, uh, that books and websites, etc., do not cause physical harm. They are ideas. It's how people act on those ideas that can cause physical harm. Ideas themselves are neutral uh, in, in terms of, uh, it's, it's how people act on them that, that I think, and, and again, I don't think it's up to, to, to librarians, uh, to, to policy makers, to, to police, uh, to make those decisions for other people. Like people both on the left and the right who complain about certain books, whether they be racist, like Tintin au Congo, which is actually a crap Tintin book, by the way. So out of, out of reasons of taste, that would be a good reason to ban it. But you know, that or, uh, we need to talk more about taste. That or, you know, um, you know, uh, Johnny has six daddies or whatever. Well, let's, make, let's, make, let's just increase the number. I mean, it's ridiculous from both sides. I think the problem is people who want to decide for other people. And, uh, you know, people should be allowed to hold insane views, and anti vaxxers are dangerous and crazy. Uh, but again, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's acting on those views, and, and, and books don't themselves, or again, books in whatever format you want to talk about, whether it be physical or digital or what have you. Uh, they don't, uh, you know, they don't do that harm themselves. It's people. Yeah, I agree absolutely with Greg. I also want to point out that we do have a lot of books that could possibly harm society. I mean, Mein Kampf is held in half our libraries, and that's the mother load of bad ideas that might encourage people to do terrible things. And we do have older um, health books that uh, give ideas and histories of things that have been discounted um, by modern science lately. So that would be, it would be nothing new to have something that might potentially give someone an idea. 
to harm themselves. But I agree with Greg with the idea piece. Is, is to give a, a lot of ideas and not be kind of a nanny to people's uh, what they're looking for or how they use that. Okay, another one. Yes. I just had a comment about how libraries are places that seem to legitimatize the material we hold within. So on the one hand, it's a positive where we can get um, older pornographic material through the customs where the sisters may not. And on the other hand, it's seen as a negative where it's seen that the library has put a rubber stamp of approval on the material that we hold within. Yeah, uh, with acquisitions and branch, that's part of what I mentioned is making patrons aware that that's not what we're doing. That, and they do come, you're absolutely right, they come with, that we have endorsed the opinion of this book, and, or the really bad writing, as the case may be, with a lot of the popular books. And that's absolutely not the case, and that's our job as librarians to say that's not the case. It's just giving a wide variety of opinions. But you're absolutely right, that's what a lot of people think. And especially when I was a children's librarian, people would come in and say, oh, so all this stuff is safe, right? And, um, <laughs> you know, you respond saying, no, it's a wide variety of views. It, the intention isn't to be safe. Um, and that they have to take, it's encouraging the patron to take a role in looking at the information providing with their own personal values and seeing if it fits those. Yes? Um, I also just had a comment. <laughs> Sorry. Um, for me, something that's always important to keep in mind, um, because I am personally challenged by material that's like homophobic and racist. Um, <coughs> I'm so sorry, I'm going to say that. It's important to keep in mind for me uh, that when I approach material that challenges me, that I'm immediately thinking of the worst case scenario for that material, which people from the other side of the spectrum also do when they encounter these materials. So they assume someone's going to pick this up and it's going to brainwash them and they're going to go out and live a terrible life. Um, <laughs> So that they don't improve up or whatever. Um, so it's important for me to approach that book and recognize that I'm imagining the worst case scenario. If I would see like an anti-vaccine book, I imagine someone's going to read that and automatically, like, you know, be like, oh, I didn't know this. I uh, agree with these conclusions. So uh, it's important uh, in my work to step back and also try to imagine the best case scenario to say, oh, uh, there's this racist book that someone's going to use to do research and write uh, really important material about racism. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Forgetting about this. <clears throat> I think the other thing to keep in mind is that is we shouldn't confine ourselves to this sort of presentist point of view, right? That books will affect us how right now, always in a particular way right now. Uh, you know, this material can have a long life and a long shelf life. And it's important to know what people thought about X, Y, Z issue 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, etc. These ideas change. So uh, libraries are also historical repositories. And historical repositories about the fact that ideas and, and views and, you know, be they political, religious, moral, whatever, and that seems to be, those seem to be the areas where people have the most uh, strong feelings. Uh, those things are not, are not necessarily permanent. Right? They're not stable. They change, they change over time. And, you know, as, a, as an academic, as a scholar, one of the interesting things that, for me is to look at how those things uh, do change. And uh, the best possible place to find that information is in libraries. Yeah, good. <laughs> uh, do we have to stop now? It's at, I think we are kind of out of time, unfortunately. So if I could just, uh, just say a few words of conclusion. I, I think we've had a, a great panel with great interest and, and good discussion. You know, as libraries, we are, we are, in my mind, we are that central place where we have all the opposing views together. And it's not for us to make those value judgments. It's really for the user to do those, um, do what they want to do with the material we have. Think about the Wikipedia or the internet. How, how many, you know, people use it to self-diagnose their, their illnesses, for example. It's not just libraries. I think this is the times we're in. So let's be open and let's, let's allow this sort of access to information, the intellectual freedom. And I really agree with Tara about we have to be vigilant. Things are happening in, 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 our, in our society that will 
clamp down a lot on some of the things that we've always espoused as librarians. So let's keep that conversation going. It's very, very important. So let's give another round of applause for our panelists. That was great. Thank you.